if just getting it done isn't good enough. If you see each obstacle as an opportunity. If you're always looking for a smarter way. You've come to the right place. We are Thornton Tomasetti. Every day, we apply engineering principles to solve the world's challenges, starting with yours. Whatever issue you face, we have your solution. We get to the heart of every problem, digging deep to understand its intricacies and nuances, so we can help you achieve your goals, together. For us, no task is too trivial and no aspiration too lofty. Here, we consider out-of-the-box methods, no matter what we're working on. Here, we share knowledge to create solutions that are greater than the sum of their parts, regardless of the task at hand. And here, the way it's been done before never limits us when doing things differently right now means doing them better in the future. Because like you, we're leaders who strive to stay one step ahead in all our work, from the everyday to the extraordinary. And we know that success isn't just about making your mark today, it's also about making an impact tomorrow. So when others say no, we say, here's how. Thornton Tomasetti, here's how. Good morning, everybody. Now that is a way to get us started on this rainy Tuesday morning. Um, it's great to see everybody and it's wonderful to have such a great attendance today on our second live installment of our Ascend webinar series. Um, as you may remember, last year we kicked off this Ascend conference talking about innovation, technology, best practices. Um, and this really is a culmination of our Innovation and Best Practices Council, uh, which was started by Tom Scarangello when he was chair of the Building Congress a few years ago. And I think we've really grown it. And, and I think thinking about where we are today in the world and what has happened since March 13th of this year, um, innovation, best practices, technology, and looking at the future is clearly something that we all must recognize um, and I think something we're all dealing with. Uh, for example, we're on a Zoom webinar, webinar today. I can honestly say, uh, and don't laugh, but on March 12th, 2020, I had never heard of the word Zoom. And today, like all of us, people watching, uh, all of us in government and in industry are living on Zoom. So imagine how quickly from one day to another the world changes. So today we're gonna to hear from the winners of the DOD's Hack the Building Code Innovation Challenge. Um, I wanna say a special thank you to our great commissioner, Melanie LaRocca from the Department of Buildings, who you will hear from shortly. Um, I don't know many people who have been as busy as Commissioner LaRocca since the middle of March in our industry and in New York City. And thank you, Melanie, for all the great work you've done. And of course, DOB's partners, NYC Economic Development Corporation, Urban Tech Hub, uh, at Company for launching this competition and spearheading the efforts to create a safe and sustainable uh, New York City. And Robinson, it's great to see you on here as well. I know you hosted one of our events last year for kicking off our conference. Uh, let me thank, of course, our trendsetter sponsor, HOK and Carl Galliotto, who is co-chair of our Council of Innovation and Best Practices. And Carl will be the moderator today. And uh, thank you, of course, to our groundbreaker sponsor, Thornton Tomasetti and Tom Scarangello, uh, co-chair of the Council of Innovation and Best Practices. And again, Tom, I think when you started this uh, innovation task force back when you were chair, um, I hope that you envisioned and knew that we were gonna really come a long way with it. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tom. Thank you for your leadership, not just in our industry, but really on getting innovation and technology to the forefront. Everyone have a great day and Tom, the floor is yours. Thanks, Carlo. 
Yeah, Carlo, you know, it, it's, it's crazy. It was uh, six years ago, as you mentioned, that we started the task force for innovation and best practice uh, with Carl and others who were there for along for the ride. And I, I got to say, early on, it was a lot of talk, uh, good talk, uh, but not a lot of action. Um, and I think in the last couple of years, uh, luckily for us, that, that, that talk has started to turn into action. And I think this event today is kind of exhibit one uh, as to what action should look like in our industry. You know, in, in June of this year, McKinsey uh, published a, a paper uh, entitled The Next Normal in Construction, and it was how disruption is reshaping the world's largest ecosystem. And if you think about disruption, many people think of disruption as a negative thing, uh, but I think it can be positive, and, and it can be positive when, it's, when, it's, when we're doing the disruption, when we, the industry itself, is actually the ones that are leading the disruption. Uh, if we let outsiders come in and, and try to rearrange how we work and, and, and what we do, uh, it's not going to be a good thing for our industry. And I think the Building Congress has done a really good job uh, over the last couple of years especially in encouraging our industry to step up and actually positively disrupt ourselves. And I really want to thank uh, Commissioner LaRocca today because, you know, what the building department did in this, in this event, in this, in this contest, was to really say, let's disrupt ourselves and let's do it positively. And I think we're going to see some really exciting um, innovation today. And I think there's a lot more going on out there. We see the, 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 the money, the support uh, through, through our, our industry. And I'm excited to hear about the, um, the winners, but I think everybody that competed on this was a winner because it really opened up the eyes of, of a lot of people to where our industry is going. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Carl Galliotto, my uh, partner in crime for the last six years. Uh, it's all yours, Carl. Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Ascend webinar uh, featuring Department of Buildings Commissioner Melanie LaRocca and the winners of the DOB's Hack the Building Code Innovation Challenge. Um, this was launched this year in addition, uh, in cooperation with New York City Economic Development Corporation, uh, Urban Tech Hub at Company, the Innovation Challenge, put an open call to the design, construction, and technology industries, inviting the public to submit their ideas on ways to improve our city's built environment. Um, the Hack the Building Code Innovation Challenge has received submissions from a wide range of organizations from across the region with ideas ranging from improving worker safety to streamlining the development process. Uh, today, we'll hear about the four winning submissions, uh, a JustCo anchor thread, uh, a, uh, a robotics co, uh, Sterolift, and T2D2. Uh, to get things started, I'd like to welcome uh, Commissioner Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of New York City Department of Buildings. Commissioner? Good morning. Thank you so much for that, Carl. Uh, and thank you to Tom um, and Robinson, who's uh, with us. And uh, of course, uh, our great fearless leader, Carlo, um, who's doing a tremendous job over at uh, Building Congress. And so is everybody there. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all this morning. Um, it's a very exciting day for us, um, where we have, uh, as um, Carl mentioned, our four winners, uh, a JustCo Anchor Thread, a Robotics Co, Sterilift, and T2D2, uh, who are going to share their innovation. And really, for the Department of Buildings, this was a year of innovation for us, and really embracing um, that that notion that we ourselves can um, move beyond the regulator, move beyond the uh, typical enforcer role, and really um, lead. Um, uh, with some great uh, leaders who already exist in the industry. So this was our attempt um, to say, you know, we're in it. Uh, we have skin in the game. We believe that this industry as a whole is so incredibly important to the city that we want to invest our time and our efforts um, and join with our partners who've been doing this as, as Building Congress has for so many years and step up and say, it's time to innovate um, and grow. And you can see we're so sustainable, my lights turned off. Um, so we're gonna roll with that for a second. Um, uh, but this year, again, like I was saying, was a, you know really a year of innovation. We launched our Hack the Building Code Innovation Challenge, and we um, presented our four winners at our first ever uh, totally digital Build Safe, Live Safe conference, which we did just a few short weeks ago. 
um, and uh, totally digital over the course of a week, 20 uh, different, over 20 different presentations, really, uh, really honing in on our safety, innovation, and sustainability as sort of the core three anchors. Um, so with uh, the presentations that come today, um, you'll hopefully hear more about the future of where we as an industry are going. And I know there was great excitement, certainly from our end to see uh, uh, submittals from all across the industry, design, construction firms, uh, technology organizations, who really came to the table and said, you know, great that DOB is willing to put their name on it. Here's some of our ideas. And I hope that this gets the ball rolling and that we collectively continu can continue to look at ourselves and challenge the way we've been working, challenge the way we've been looking at codes um, and construction and say we can do things differently um, and that will uh, increase uh, success for everybody um, and really uh, bring home what we've all been trying to do, which is make the industry smarter uh, and safer. So thank you all uh, for having me uh, join in this morning. And I'm very excited uh, that you all will hear from our four winners. They are really uh, you know, cutting edge ideas um, and also some really useful uh, uh, things that will make us, like I said, a stronger and smarter uh, and safer industry. So thank you all uh, very much and congratulations to our four winners. Thank you, Commissioner. We appreciate the uh, uh, the comments, but more than the comments, it's more about the attitude, about uh, openness and excitement for the future, because I really believe that these are exciting times. Uh, they're scary, but they're exciting. Uh, there will be major changes coming out of this, and, uh, and I find that uh, just uh, ter terribly exciting uh, for all of us to be in the midst of this and for us to be shaping the future of our industry. Uh, I would like, uh, like to introduce now Robinson Hernandez, Executive Director of the Urban Tech Hub at Company, one of the partner organizations of this challenge. Robinson. Thanks, Carl. I want to thank you, Carl, the New York Building Congress. I want to thank the Commissioner and DOB and all the participants. And I do want to build a little bit on what you just said about the excitement that comes out of these types of collaborations. And so we at the Urban Tech Hub at Company work very closely with the city. And part of that is this effort on really trying to reinforce the urban tech community. Construction tech, prop tech, all of those industries are part of that. And how do we try to address some of the high energy costs in the cities? How do we address climate change? How do we address government regulation? And how do we support an industry where we think that they can bring a lot of value and efficiency to a market? The construction industry globally represents over $10 trillion. 7% of all workforce is in the construction industry. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to play a role in having an impact and how we can improve on many of those processes. As we know here in New York City, 30% of major projects eventually have some sort of major change that result in a delay or an increased cost. And so for us, the idea was, how do we bring a competition working closely with the city in getting them to challenge the tech industry to say, you guys know well on how to extract some of those efficiencies, how to bring some of that creativity that you have in your head to an industry like ours. One where 67% of the city's emissions, carbon emissions come out of the 1 million buildings that we have in the city of New York. And so that was something that we were very excited on being able to partner. And we look forward to continuing to do many of these. The beauty is our ability to be situated in the center, the headquarters of the prop tech construction tech community in the world, New York. And so we were very excited when the four companies were selected out of many. There were almost 100 submissions that came through for the competitions with the Department of Buildings. And we're excited about that interaction between the private and the public where we can come together to find solutions. So we encourage the industry to continue to work hard, do a lot for it. Um, we at the at company are looking at doing that. In fact, we're creating the city's first vertical tech campus, 1.2 million square feet of space, housing startups. And so we're seeing this change. Are we facing challenges? Yes. But at the same time, we know that we have an opportunity to overcome. So I want to congratulate the companies because you guys are doing amazing work and helping us to build a better, safer, cleaner city. So thank you to all. Thank you, Robinson. Uh, and now what we've been waiting for I'm certainly waiting for this to see the presentations of each of the winners. Um, a reminder, uh, if uh, for everyone watching, you can submit questions uh, that you have for the presenters in the Q&A function. 
uh, that's on the screen uh, anytime during the webinar. Now, we will answer them at the end and we'll direct them at the end, but please feel free to, uh, to type in the questions. First up, we're gonna hear about uh, a JustCo's Anchor Thread product presented by Jason Style. Jason? So I'll jump right into it. Uh, JustCo is, uh, we're a products company that specializes in the hardware and retail industry. And this, what you're looking at here is our Anchor Thread. This is a typical uh, site you'll see on job sites where uh, the workers are drilling into the concrete for any, any kind of anchor point. And they can't see the, the rebar, the reinforced bar that's inside the concrete. So often they'll hit the bar and they'll have to pull the drill out and keep putting it back in. This is an actual, these are real pictures on job sites. Uh, this is a leading edge protection. This is a, uh, a piece of equipment for, for HVAC unit. And then you see here, this is what our unit looks like, which I'll, I'll describe as I move through the presentation. So simply before your formwork is installed, this is your uh, uh, a column install. You, you just nail in this tab here. You pop in the anchor, spin it uh, clockwise 90 degrees. You close the form. You pour your concrete. You can see the anchor is, is buried inside this formwork. Like, you know, you're baking a, baking a cake here. When you strip your formwork, you're left with the anchor inside the concrete and that's what you'll see. And this is what you'll connect to. And this would be for your deck installation. So they're preparing a floor here, nail it in, put your rebar cage in, pour your concrete, here's your form being stripped. We have a little tool to remove the escutcheon if necessary. And then you're left with this concrete anchor baked inside the superstructure. And so one of the main, uh, components that we're, we're saving here is, is silica dust. Silica dust is a huge issue. There's thousands and thousands of holes that need to be drilled into these brand new buildings for all types of anchor points, whether it's fall protection on the leading edge or all of the MEP equipment that's getting uh, drilled into the ceiling. This eliminates uh, hours and hours of ladder time and falling off the ladders is a number one, you know, safety issue on job sites. So this is eliminating a whole bunch of time that the guys need to be on ladders because the anchors are already in place. They still obviously need to go up there to put in the equipment, but it's about 50% savings of ladder time for the MEP. Obviously the, the, the lower noise, neighbors, businesses are constantly dealing with the, 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 the noise on site. So we'd love to, we're, we're happy to reduce that, that issue. I'm going to show you some sites here where we're actually installed, whether it was for a demo installation or we're actually going into the entire superstructure. So these are units being installed here into the column. This is the column being stripped. You can see we already have an anchor right here. There's the units into concrete column. Here's the actual leading edge protection getting anchored in. And there's a, a lovely shot of the trade tower back there, the Freedom Tower with the units installed. So this is your leading edge protection until they put the actual shell of the building up. Uh, here's another project that we're going into on the second half of the project. This is, uh, you see Hudson Yards in the background. Those are units going in. There's the Javits Center. Here's another job on 34th Street. We're going into the entire superstructure here. There's uh, the units. There's right before the cables are installed. This is a, 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 a D-bolt that you can hook into for life safety. Uh, something that we'll be launching in maybe next three to six months. And, and currently the guys are hooking into uh, straps that are hanging down out of the ceiling and those straps get cut out eventually, whereas this unit can be moved from floor to floor. Here's uh, one of the first projects we were on last, last year. Um, there's the column. There's uh, Central Park in the background. And there's the units just, just getting ready for the leading edge. And there's your, there's your cable. And here's the guys installing them in the deck. When the first rebar cage is in, after this is installed, the second cage will go in, and then the units can be installed right before the concrete is poured. And there's the units in the deck after the concrete is poured, and you can connect to these for any type of equipment, uh, sprinkler systems, uh, electrical lines, plumbing. And as you can see, there's, there's no drilling here. This is just ready to go. So the product is safer and stronger, faster and greener. And it's that simple. 
I want to thank everyone at the New York City buildings and the New York Build Congress and Urban Tech Hub for uh, giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. That. So next we'll see a presentation on uh, a robotics company, uh, Imager Robot by uh, Akash Kancharla. Hello, good morning, thank you. So thank you, DOB, Urban Tech Hub, uh, New York Building Congress, and of course, Ms. Commissioner for taking the time to into my presentation here. I'm a robotics company. We make, design, uh, innovate robots that conduct work on the exteriors of tall buildings. Uh, we have robots that do cleaning, non-destructive testing. Today I'll be presenting our imager robot, which is going to transform the way that local law 11 inspections are done in New York City. So first things first, these inspections are extremely routine. They have to happen uh, at least every five years, oftentimes uh, more, more often than that to maintain safety. They are risky and inefficient. And because of their frequency, we believe that our imager robot is going to make this practice a lot safer, a lot more efficient. We're going to give better inspections and we're going to be able to do this at a lower cost to all parties involved. Currently, engineers need to travel to the site. They are usually going to be accompanied by at least two special riggers, and they will be on a gondola going up and down the side of the building. The process is obviously expensive. It puts at least three people directly in harm's way by suspending them from the side of the building. Uh, it's going to be extremely time consuming and and as mentioned, those hazards introduce a lot of inefficiency into this process. On the other hand, some other solutions are proposing drones, um, cure robots that are going to fly around. Those obviously introduce their own intrinsic risk. They're not going to be nearly as resilient as these gondolas, and they are indeed a technology that is often misunderstood and misrepresented. We believe that we strike a nice compromise between these two. Our solution is to use a solid aluminum frame that's going to traverse the building in lieu of a gondola. No people need to be on board our robot. We're going to use time-tested mechanical elements to deliver innovation without any of the risks that typically accompany such innovation. We'll go into some of these components in a bit more detail here. Our cameras are going to be at least 4K. We can give higher resolution if the need is warranted. We have two time-tested uh, voice by Allied Power, a well-established company um, rated by UL. Each one of these can lower our robot safely on its own, so there's a lot of built-in redundancy. Uh, as mentioned, the frame is aircraft-grade aluminum. We have a safety factor well in excess of 15, superlative aerodynamics and it's gonna weigh in at less than 40 pounds. We don't expect to use them, but we do have these pneumatic buffers in place just in case there's an unexpected gust. Uh, we've simulated up to 100 MPH and we aren't going to damage facades except for thinnest of glass. We'll go into these capabilities a bit more detail. Our cameras are built in, stabilized. So even though one might envision achy image or a unstable video, that's simply not going to happen. A person standing on a gondola vibrates a good deal more than our cameras because they have those mechanical dampeners built into the lenses. The lenses are custom. We can adjust the convexity so that we can do one run with a really nice wide field of view. We can do another one focusing in on problematic spots on what the engineer wants to do. Uh, and we can also swap these units out very easily for um, infrared or thermal options, uh, which can help reveal insulation breaks, uh, very hairline fractures, water penetration, things like that. As mentioned, that resolution is well beyond what a human eye is uh, able to see. So the engineer sitting on their computer is going to be able to zoom in a lot more than um, them standing on the gondola, leaning toward the building. It's gonna be a much more efficient process uh, that gives a lot more information to that engineer. As mentioned, our hoists are not only very strong, but they're also faster than gondolas. Uh, running at about 30 PPM, 
and we can do a solid 25 story building well within an hour if you include a setup disassembly time in there. It's also integrated AC brakes in both of these units. So if there's a power loss, if there's a communication interruption for whatever reason, the unit is simply going to stay put very safe. Obviously, no one's on the rig, so it can be brought down at its leisure. Uh, there is active heat dissipation in place to make sure that these run smoothly every single time. We have no intention of operating in driving rain or snow, uh, but they are weatherproof for that. So if there is an unexpected shower, we can definitely safely just go back to the ground and uh, come again. As mentioned, the aluminum alloy frame strikes a nice balance between weight and performance. We do follow the OSHA recommendation well over um, 10 safety factor. That aerodynamic design is going to create uh, both turbulent flow as well as directed gusts a lot better than um, current gondolas. And as mentioned, it's going to be more stable than drones also, especially propeller-based drones, which uh, if you do have turbulent flow or gusts, those are going to vibrate and shake intrinsically. As mentioned, we don't really have any intention of using these buffers, but if there is that very unexpected, sudden, sustained burst of wind from any direction, it's going to help dissipate uh, any of that input load against the building. Those um, thermomechanical dampeners are just gonna absorb that impulse in lieu of the building facade, convert that into heat, and uh, that just minimizes even the most remote chance of changing any exterior. There are also automatic electronic safety checks that are in place uh, throughout our rig. For example, if uh, those gusts do cause sway, the robot can uh, decelerate on its own. The operator on the ground is able to appropriately view obstacles. We have LIDARs and ultrasonic sensors in place so that if someone, uh, for example, sticks out their hand, and imagine um, maybe a professional basketball player sticks out their hand three feet in the way of the robot. That's going to be detected automatically. It'll stop. The person on the ground can then um, assess whether they want to continue up or summarize these safety elements. Uh, as mentioned, aerodynamic. Uh, obviously, there's a lot smaller cross sectional area that this rig is using. Very lightweight when it's fully loaded, all the hoists weight, et cetera, in place, you're still at under 30 pounds. Um, we have those automatic electronics in, in place just in case something happens. Uh, there is a lot of redundancy, being redundant myself when I say that, but as mentioned, each of those hoists can lower this robot or, or raise the robot if, uh, depending on whatever is the deepest maneuver, uh, just in case anything happens. Summarize our core advantages. Uh, as mentioned, we're going to give more thorough inspection. That's simply because the visual capabilities that we're offering are well beyond what a um, presumably nervous engineer uh, suspended on the side of the building is going to be able to accomplish. Uh, there's better zoom, there's better resolution, and there's better stability. And as mentioned, those engineers, they're not going to be stressed for time. They're going to be sitting in their office. They can share their videos with uh, colleagues. Uh, we can also just send these videos to different firms. We can get different opinions. There is a lot more accountability here because these videos are stored. They can be reviewed. The operation itself is going to be safer because it is a lighter weight system. It is more stable and it is more resilient. So there's no people actually ever directly in harm's way. Uh, the worst thing you can realistically do with this is drop it on your foot, which is a few times, and, and it doesn't hurt that much. There are built-in mechanical redundancies. There are built-in electronic redundancies. And of course, it, the, the big point uh, that we all are thinking uh, is that it's going to be less expensive. We need fewer people to more drop, and we can do that in less so all three are in your favor with our system. Setup is really fast. We can complete four sides well within a day. And that lighter weight is also going to translate into less insurance hazard and also less intense anchoring system. We can anchor to the side of the building using very typical safety bolts or clamps that just uh, attach to the parapet or other roof structures. 
Uh, just a couple of sample images here that we we took. Um, obviously, the stability is uh, unparalleled. A person standing on the gondola uh, is not going to be able to save these images neatly. You can zoom in a lot more than what I'm showing here, uh, at least 16x per the resolution that we're on. And, that, and that's it. Thank you a lot for your time. Um, more information can obviously be found on our website, www.gayrobotic.com to working with uh, EOB to get the appropriate permits and hope to help make this process a lot safer for everyone soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Akash. That was terrific. So next, we're going to hear from uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Gretzak of uh, uh, CEC Elevator Cab Corporation uh, about Sterilect. Thank you, Carl. Um, while I'm waiting to get my screen, a little bit of background about CEC Elevator and myself. Uh, CEC Elevator Cab is a elevator cab door and entrance manufacturer. We're located in the Bronx, New York. Um, been in business for about 28 years, as well as I have in the elevator industry, both on the elevator cab side and also the elevator entrance side and also the elevator side as, as well. So we, we do have a a very good um, um, understanding of elevators and elevators themselves. What we're facing today, um, once I heard about COVID and we all started the shutdowns, um, we were considered an essential company. So we were left with not having to shut down at all when everything started uh, closing. But basically, as the buildings started closing down because of COVID and construction sites and basically buildings not wanting the work done, uh, we shut down for about a week and a half uh, around March. In that time, I started thinking about what we could do. And I started extensive research, research on COVID, SARS-CoV-2, which is what actually creates COVID, um, how it's trans, uh, trans, you know, uh, transferred from one person to another, the, the transmission of it, uh, started reading into CDC studies and who, and really started getting into the scientific nature of how to fight this. What we developed was a product called Sterilift. Sterilift basically is a elevator air sterilization system. This system was created to pretty much combat COVID and the problems that we're having right now uh, by actually attacking the virus itself. What my studies had found was this primarily is an airborne virus, which is being basically agreed to now by CDC and WHO. And the problems inside an elevator is that we don't have really any circulation at all. And uh, there's no way to actually get the viruses out. We've already gone through testing with ETL. So we are UL certified for 507 for United States and also standard C22.2 rule 187 in Canada. We are CARB certified in California, which means that this system creates absolutely no ozone. We uh, just yesterday became New York State OGS listed, which is where we're going to be for sale on their website for any governmental buildings. And right now we have just completed intertech efficacy testing to see the actual viral kill and bacterial inactivation of the system itself. We also went underwent a UL air quality monitor test down in Washington, D.C., where they actually monitored our system as compared to a standard elevator with a standard fan. And the results were very, very, very good. I don't know why we're not moving to the next one. CDC and WHO both agree that SARS-CoV-2 is propagated by airborne particles or what are called viral carriers that are actually expelled from human beings when they either cough, sneeze, breathe, speak, sing. I don't know why they say sing, but I don't know how many people sing inside an elevator. But even the breathing can uh, uh, release particles. For instance, our research showed that a typical cough from an infected person can create up to 500,000 particles that range in 0.3 or less than 0.3 microns up to 10 microns. These particles are basically put inside the elevator cab, they come out of the purse, they come out of the side of the uh, masks, they're floating in the air, and basically right now nothing is done. And we have a little bit of proof that nothing is done by a contact trace study that was done in uh, uh, China, where one woman had come to the United States she came back, she took a test, and she was positive. They asked her to quarantine, and she did everything by the book. She went straight home, straight in her elevator, right up to her apartment, and never came out for 14 days. 
contact tracing found that 70 people were infected from that one elevator ride. Basically people that were walking inside the elevator afterwards and getting either infected by what's in the air or what was allowed to settle on the buttons themselves. Current codes, believe it or not, even though everybody sees fans, hears fans inside an elevator, current code requirements actually don't require a fan at all in a typical passenger elevator. The only ventilation that's actually required is what's called natural ventilation, which are basically just slots in the base of the elevator and slots up at the top of the car that allow air to come in and out of the car when the car moves, which is very, very menial. Not much comes in or out. And the only time forced ventilation or any type of fan is ever required is on a glass elevator or observation type elevator that is directly exposed to sunlight. With that in mind, you can see that elevators really never kind of looked at what could we do about ventilation inside, even though we have that in other areas of the building. We designed Starlift to basically provide proper circulation, removing air from the ceiling of the elevator, drawing everything up, which includes all the particles that might be lingering inside the air. It then goes through twin MERV 13 filtration to basically take as much as the particles out of the air and that UL test actually showed about 97% of the particles taken out of the air. Anything that goes through those two filters gets a blast of UVC germicidal irradiation. And yes, we have calculated that. It's about a 20 millijoule per uh, cubic centimeter dose. We're not adding any dangerous additives. I have seen systems that are out for sale right now that uh, they're either sold as ion, positive, negative, positive, negative ion, PICO, all of these systems create a dangerous additive. Uh, anytime you create an ion, it creates ozone. Ozone in high concentration is toxic. And inside an elevator without any ventilation, that could be a very dangerous situation. We also designed this to be a semi-sealed system from the shaft way. What that means is that this actually comes into ductwork from the inside of the car. It's drawn to the ceiling. It goes into the system, which again is sealed from the shaft way. And then we pipe it down and ductwork down the side of the elevator and back into the base. So at no time is shaft way ever, ever infiltrated into the system. The most important part of that actual design is, again, I've seen other products that are being sold that use shaft way air and whether they treat it or not, uh, anything that's inside that shaft way will be pumped into the car and most dangerously smoke if there's ever a smoke condition in shaft way. Basically, we designed the system that the only thing we're putting back into the car is fresh, clean air. Our UL test was conducted on two elevators side by side in a occupied commercial building down in Washington, actually Virginia. Uh, what they found was that over a one month period, basically bringing it down to averages, in 95.5% less PM10, 95.79 less PM2.5, I won't bore you by reading the rest of them. Basically, it just means well over 90% of most particles that are inside the elevator or any common elevator, even with the fan running, are taken out by this system and germicidally treated. The difference that we have that we spoke before is that we're pulling everything out by 710 cubic feet per minute, which is more than enough to exchange the air up to two times per minute in a standard 3,500 pound car which is your normal workhorse for commercial elevators or hotel properties and so forth. This is now drawn into that system in a closed system that doesn't really go into the shaft way at all, allows nothing but fresh, clean air coming out of that system to be pumped back into the bottom of the elevator. This in turn forcing the air up as well on top of the 710 cubic feet per minute, which in theory uh, basically takes a cough at human level height, face height, and it draws it up and away from everybody as opposed to down towards the floor where it could be allowed to settle or more dangerously be pumped out onto the floors when the doors open and close. Other systems, again, like we're talking about are pumping in shaft way air. The other problem with that that we're seeing and that we wanna make sure everybody knows about is that even though there are systems out there that show filters like ours and show UVC like ours, if they're treating shaft way air, virtually nothing inside that car is ever treated and it'll be pumped down towards the floor of the elevator to remain there until the doors open and some of it gets out. But again, we're trying to kill the virus, not put it someplace else. We've done extensive research as I spoke of before, including all kinds of medical tests dealing with the, uh, 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 the um, 
uh, CDC looking into WHO, the World Organi Health Organization, and uh, basically trying to design the absolute best system that we feel is the most efficient system on, uh, out, uh, on the market and also the safest. Engineering has been done by myself and it's been meticulously done. And actually the first prototype I built in my garage. <laughs> um, UL testing and everything else, we've done our own testing in-house. You can see my little mock-up cab that we have standing up in our facility. And that unit that you see right there right now, I can hardly even see the letters on it anymore because it is covered in dust from my normal operations of making elevator cabs. And that system still is absolutely positively clean and the filters are pristine. And that's been running for about nine months right now. We've installed the sterile lift on approximately over 100 elevators. We are currently in 10 states, 13 different cities and growing. And the word is getting out that this is the way that we can hopefully mitigate the risks on the inside of an elevator of a building, which is basically your focal point right now to where you get most of your congestion coming in and out of the building, as well as your most crippling part of the building in terms of trying to social distance. Sterile lift again, ETL listed, you all performed. I won't go over the rest of the stuff, but I will let you know that we've started innovating more since we've won the Hack the Building Code Challenge. We have developed sterile cab, which is actually a new enclosure. So when you're doing elevator work, you can actually make an elevator that literally breeds. It's a much more efficient use of the actual system itself. And it's built basically that all the air is taken in from instead of from the base, you're actually taking it out from in between your wall panels. So you don't see anything. And as soon as someone coughs anywhere, immediately it's gonna be taken out of the car. We have also developed a beefed up system. What I mean by that is I've made it a little bit larger since I don't have the confines of an elevator. I've increased my fan CFM and increased my duct work. And we have now created sterile room that we will be putting out very soon. And this particular system you see drawn right there, I've designed to basically take out up to 14 air exchanges per hour of a typical 10,000 cubic, uh, cubic foot room or what you would know as a common high school classroom. I sincerely thank everybody for your time and I hope that uh, this helps to not only get us all back to work safely, but to hopefully get our economy, our buildings and everybody else rolling again. And again, I thank you for your time. Nicholas, thank you. And uh, talk about the, the right product in the right place at the right time. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I think you nailed it. Yes, thank you. We were all eager to have uh, to return to our offices with uh, with the assurance, and you you could have this sterile lift sticker that goes on the elevator, so so people have an assurance. That last frame was the sticker we provided with every unit. <laughs> exactly. and oh, yeah. Everybody's looking for it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Very well done. Thank you. Um, our final presentation for today is uh, courtesy of uh, Audrey uh, Hiriu of Thornton Tomasetti. Uh, to talk about their T, uh, T2, D2 tool. So, uh, good morning. We are uh, delighted to be recognized as one of the winners of the Hack the Building Code Innovation Contest. Uh, through this challenge, the New York City Department of Buildings has started an excellent initiative to modernize the city building codes to accept cutting edge technologies that can enhance the safety and efficiency of the prescriptive process. Then T2, D2, and demonstrate the use of AI and computer vision technology to transform the facade inspection process to make it more safer and more cost-effective. The primary objective of current regulations surrounding building facade inspections is ensuring public safety. That's the number one goal. Can we achieve this objective, even enhance public safety, while at the same time making the process more cost and time efficient? As some of the other entries, uh, including the robotics, uh, and, and drone technologies have shown, I think quite impressively in my opinion, the answer is yes. Uh, drones and other robotic technologies can be effectively deployed to virtually inspect large building envelopes and quickly and easily collect vast amounts of data about the state of facades and structures. But you know, it will result in terabytes and terabytes of data. How do we make sense of the data? How do we convert that data into information and that information into insight about the state of the facade. We present to you T2D2, or Thornton Thomas City Damage Detector, 
Over the last few years, computer vision technology has made tremendous strides, achieving better than human performance over several benchmark studies. This has led to wide adoption in various industries, including consumer technologies, security, and medical diagnosis. Through T2D2, we bring the same technology to the AEC industry. We have deployed state-of-the-art computer vision models, a narrow form of AI powered by deep learning to automatically detect damage and deterioration from image and video feeds. TT has been inspecting buildings through its renewal practice and forensics practice for many decades. And we have a large collection of photographs showing various forms of damage and deterioration in structures. The T2D2 computer vision models have been trained on these data sets that are carefully annotated by our experts. T2D2 has been deployed to process images taken by drones as well as mobile devices and other traditional cameras. So how does it work and what is under the hood? T2D2 is not a single monolithic damage detection model that, uh, that just uh, results in damaged uh, annotations, but it's actually a pipeline of various modules that are built using machine learning. Some of these modules are a binary segmentation classifier that extracts the structure portion of the image and, uh, you know, and, and classifies the background as part of the image that can be ignored. Then it goes through a proximity classifier and a gridding tool for virtually zooming into high resolution images that are taken from a distance. This way, small cracks uh, that may not be visible from a drone image taken from maybe five or 10 feet away uh, are actually zoomed in and you can, um, you, you can recognize that defect from a distance. The material classifier is next in the pipeline. It identifies the substrate material, such as you know, brick masonry, concrete, glass, um, steel, stucco, and so on. And depending on this material classification, we pass it down to the appropriate damage detection modules. These modules will identify various types of damage conditions that are specific to each material. For example, cracked mortar joints in brick masonry, spalling or exposed rebar in concrete, corrosion in steel structures, and so on. Finally, the output stream is recomposed back to its original size from the original gridded images and then handed over to downstream functions such as generating reports and so on. Photogrammetry is routinely used on drone feeds to build 3D interactive photorealistic models. T2D2 can process these same image frames to identify damage conditions. And also in the process, the 3D models can be geotagged with T2D2 damage detections. That way you have an interactive 3D model that had, that shows and highlights where you have defects that need to be addressed. Uh, or, you know, in, instead of uh, 3D models, you can also uh, build uh, 2D orthomosaics. So T2D2 can geotag these 2D orthomosaics, which can be, you know, many gigabytes in size for a single image composed from many hundreds of sub images. And T2D2 uses a sliding window approach to identify defects in you know in every square inch of this uh, of this facade now while t2d2 is smart and can identify a lot of defects it is of course not perfect it too makes mistakes sometimes flagging a stray tree branch or wires or cracks as um, you know uh, wires as cracks or it sometimes misses flagging some conditions so we have a team of engineers review the photographs and the detections and mark up the false positives and false negatives. These corrections are then fed back to our training database so that T2D2 can learn from them and get better over time. It's a continuously learning system. The T2D2 online portal can serve as a repository to host the digital twins of the building envelopes. As photo inspections are repeated for a structure, the T2D2 portal can track how damage conditions at specific locations evolve over time. In some cases, they may also provide early warnings so that certain conditions are developing that may be easy to fix at an early stage instead of developing into costly and potentially unsafe or dangerous conditions if ignored. In summary, T2D2 brings the latest digital technologies to bear to transform the building facade inspection process while promising to enhance public safety and increase efficiency. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it seems that the, you know, the, the Zoom system works with, in terms of Q&A. Uh, people have been asking questions and they're being answered uh, on the fly. Um, the one that is, uh, is not answered, I don't know if anyone from the Department of Buildings is here, but the question is, will DOB accept an A-Robotics um, 
inspection uh, as mandated as close up inspection. Now, uh, again, I don't know if anyone from DOB is on, but if, uh, if not, I think I'm willing to bet that yes, uh, that, the, uh, that the Department of Buildings uh, uh, sponsorship and leadership that they're exhibiting uh, with regard to this challenge uh, will lead them to do so. Um, so uh, I will answer on behalf of uh, Commissioner Loraca that I believe that the answer is going to be yes. There was a question. I I, um, I believe that this uh, has to do. This obviously has to do with the uh, uh, the elevators, and uh, the question has to do with the uh, height of the building relative to the uh, the function of the system. Concern is uh, Nicholas is of course the uh, the stack effect. Uh, I actually, I actually just finished typing the answer, but uh, oh okay. Oh, Sin, actually, stack effect and piston effect is, is a confusing thing for people to understand. Right. Um, basically, stack effect, what that is, is that as the temperature is outside the building is different than the inside of the building, it creates differentials in pressure. Um, based upon whether it's winter or summer, you're going to get a stack effect of pulling into the shaft way in half the building and pulling out and pushing out of the shaft way in, in the other half of the building. So stack effect becomes this draft that's either going up or down the shaft way. When it comes to the inside of the elevator though, and, and everybody that's gone into a high rise building will understand as soon as I say this. If you're standing inside the elevator, even on your windiest day and you're, you hear the whistling of the air in the shaft way, when you're standing inside the elevator, you don't feel anything. That stack effect creates kind of like an air curtain because it's coming from the shaft way, it's going in between the doors and then it's either going immediately out or immediately into the shaft way at the landing itself. So. Stack effect or piston effect also from other elevators running in the shaft way really don't have that much of an effect on the inside of the car. But just in case where anybody has that question, again, this is a sealed system. So I'm taking air out of the actual cab itself, forcing it into the system and then pumping it back in. So no, any type of shaft way pressures or stack effect or anything do not have any effect on the system at all. And our we were about halfway done with uh, installations at One Pen Plaza, which has enormous stack effect. And I've yeah. actually tested the system, and there is no there's no difference. That's great. That's uh, you know, Pen Plaza is certainly a real challenge, and I think that uh, uh, if it works there, if yep. you make it there, you'll make it anywhere. I could tell you the cabs were a challenge too. We're building those also. There's a lot of innovation in that building, including a 70 inch LCD screen behind a hinged glass wall. <laughs> it's a marvel of engineering that building. Are there any other questions? Uh, there's one more Thank question. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, one more question I see too is uh, Port Authority, New York, New Jersey. Um, we're actually working on a couple of projects right now, elevator wise with Port Authority, New York, New Jersey, including uh, Liberty Airport in Newark. Uh, yes, we have contacted them. Uh, Bill Dye is uh, basically their lead guy when it comes to elevators. He's aware of the system and he's looking into it and hopefully we could do something with them. Great, great. Well, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank the, uh, the sponsors and I'd also uh, not like to thank the gardeners working outside that you might be able to hear. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to thank the sponsors and I'd like to thank all the winners of this. These are really great products. Uh, once again, uh, you know, challenging times like this uh, give us great opportunity for great innovation. And I'd like to thank you and congratulate you on, on winning. It's really exciting. And, and thank you for your participation and these great ideas that are helping the industry. Thank you. Else? Thank you. Great day. And thank you for joining. You too. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.